Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Our guest today is one of Australia's foremost thought leaders and change agents. Her name is Karen Swain, and like many of us, she's had questions about life, death, and what might lie beyond. After losing her mother at 16, Karen has some extraordinary psychic experiences with the other side. And because of this, she realized that we don't have to be a famous medium to see, hear, feel, and maintain communication with loved ones who have crossed over. Karen Swain is a radio show host. She's the author of the book, Return to Love. She has witnessed miraculous healings. She's a transformational intuitive life coach who helps people worldwide live their greatest lives. There is so much more to the incredible Karen Swain, but I'll let y- her tell you more about herself. Karen Swain, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Oh, Sandro, thank you so much. Wow, that was quite an introduction. That's wow. Thank you so much. That's, well, uh, you're welcome. And wow. I've been on your site, and it's like, wow, oh, you do so much, and you're so generous, and you're all about making a difference with people. Oh. And I've watched some of your videos and listened to an oh. audio, and I'm just like, I love this woman. So I, I knew oh. we would be soul sisters I, I love that about you that you actually took the time out to really to really watch like look what's going on on the side I've, sp- I've spoken to so many people that that don't bother they just like tell me about you and they don't actually look into who am I talking to like they're not generous enough to extend their time to actually research so congratulations you oh, Sandra but sometimes I get intimidated because it's like, oh, my, who am I to talk to this person or you? Oh, and you're up to so many things. But I, I always believe that we all have that little voice in our head that's not always our cheerleader. And so it's just set it aside. And yeah, we're all extraordinary. Absolutely. And, yeah. So why don't you jump in and tell us a little bit about you. And obviously the name of the show is We Don't Die. And I would come to believe that you have um, have had some experiences, especially what I read in the beginning. And just, just a little bit about you, if you would, whatever you want to share. Uh, look, I just want to continue on that, 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 that thread of conversation mm-hmm. about that little voice. Because even though the, uh, the introduction sounds amazing, God, listening to that, I'm thinking, wow, who is that person? I'd like to be her too. <laughs> I still have that little voice that says, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. But here's the thing about that little voice that I love. It is that is that doubting part of us that is the creative part of us that if we did know everything and we did have access to all that we are because through my understanding and my life journey of looking into who are we and who 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 are where do we come from like where do we come from when mum died the questions that I had inside me I was one of those kids that was like why am I here and why do babies have to be baptized? I don't understand if a baby's born, how it can be in sin. You know, religion says this and constantly badgering my parents with questions, questions, questions. And they were just like, oh, ask your father or ask your mother. I don't know. Why do you have to know these things, Karen? Just, Just intensely curious about life, love and the universe. Who am I? What am I doing here? What's it all about, Alfie? And then when mum got sick and died, she got sick in my early teens, you know, when you're in your early teens, Sandra, all you want to do is date boys and oh, and, right. buy sh- and buy shoes. But um, my focus was sort of shifted because I was dealing with this mother who was horrifically sick and very unhappy. And, and in my selfish teenage ideology, I'm thinking, gee, your sickness is, interfe- is interfering in my love life. I, you know, I have to stay home and look after you instead of go out and party with boys. Wow. I know. Wow. Right. But, but it, it's that, real. I mean, I I real. thought my parents were stupid, and what did they know about life? I, you know, as a teenager, we don't really understand it all. Yeah, look, yeah, I, I don't know if I thought my parents were stupid, and I, they didn't know about life at that stage. But I definitely, yeah, you definitely had that teenage, oh, yeah. like uh, they don't understand about me. They don't understand about mm-hmm. me. You don't know. What do you know? 
But those questions kept brewing inside me, brewing, brewing, brewing. And I think the thing that really did it was my mother's spiritual education to me was I, I was a naughty girl at school and I was expelled from one of the schools and, and a Catholic school took me in. They, the, the nuns ran the school mm -hmm. and we were not Catholic. And, um, but it was a convent. And I said to my mother, what am I going to do about all that religious stuff, mum? And she said, just ignore it, darling. <laughs> spiritual <laughs> education. <laughs> In a Catholic school. <laughs> Just ignore oh, okay. it. But I was only there for a year and she died during that year. But during that year, the nuns went to visit her in hospital. And here's this selfish little teenage girl thinking about boys and shoes, thinking, now why are Catholic nuns visiting my mother in hospital when she's not Catholic? And how come they've accepted me and I'm not Catholic? Because, you know, with all this religious stuff, there's all these rules and regulations, you know, who's invited into whose club. And... Um, and then when she died, just before she died, I went into hospital to see her while she was still conscious because there was a few weeks while she was not really here with us. And there was a priest reading the Bible next to her bed. And I'm saying to mum when he left, what are you doing, mum? And she said, I'm dying, Karen, I'm dying. And I looked at her confusion and her her desperateness, grasping, grasping at some sort of answers. Here's a woman that never asked a question about what happens after we die. Never thought about it. Just never thought about it and, and didn't inspire any questions in me about that. And here she is dying and grasping at, you know, what's it all about and will I go to hell and will I go to heaven? And so that really spurred those questions like, yeah, like what does happen when we die? Who are we? Do we go to heaven? How do we live our life? What's it all about? So that's when I started this trajectory of this intense search for meaning. But um, getting back to what I was saying before, that little voice inside us that doesn't know, that doubts, that criticizes ourselves, that is the creative part of us. That is the part of us that reaches out into life and says, why? And as we do reach out into life with our questions and our asking and our prayers and whatever it is that we're asking for, it could be knowledge, it could be health, it could be money. We summon, we summon the energy that comes to answer the call and that is the creative part of us. So I love that little voice inside me that doubts and criticizes me sometimes. Well, that's I a do. nice way of putting it because I've, I've not had that relationship. I just thought, well, we all have it. This is how you deal yeah. with it, but I've never yeah. thought well, of one it. Of the things, cool. Yeah, one, one of the things that I've learned is that in this vibrational universe that we all live in, you can't scream no at something and have it go away. You can't push against anything and not have it exist in your life because our attention and our focus is the creative aspect. So when we put our attention on something, when we look at something, uh, when we say, I want this, or when we say, I don't want this, we bring it into our life. Right. And so... If we don't want that little critical, critical voice that we have inside us that, that, that puts us down, that compares us to others as not being good enough, that, mm -hmm. that you know, that you know it. We all have I it. I know right, it you know. well, yes. As you push against that aspect of yourself, it just grows. <laughs> it gets bigger. So it's kind of like a little kid that lives inside you, a naughty little kid, you know, that naughty little teenager that was selfish and like that I used to be. It's like you love it. Give it, feed it cookies. Calm down, darling. All will be well, you know. Wow. Stop pushing, <laughs> stop pushing against it and saying I should be different or this shouldn't be or I should be you know, more enlightened by now. I've read 6 million books and I've spoken to 50 million people. I should know better by now. You, you're never going to know better because that little part of you is the creative part of you that keeps asking questions. And I know that you're like me, Sandra. You are intensely curious about people and mm -hmm. and that's that's a beautiful thing. That's a really beautiful thing. Mm. So, well, thank you um, for that. Yeah. Yeah. So mum dies. Yep. I'm... I'm in the world, I'm 16, I'm, I'm all alone, but I'm loving that because I'm thinking, this is great. Because as a kid, I just was like a bull at a gate. Get me out of here. I want to wear high heels and lipstick and live life. You know, I, I didn't want to be told what to do. I didn't want parents saying I couldn't do things. So here I am, I'm out in the world. I have the life to lead that I wanted to lead. So I wasn't particularly 
sad about mum's passing because watching someone ill like that, really ill, is not fun. And when they leave that experience, you know, it's such a relief. And I got the call at about four o'clock at night, the hospital called to say that she'd gone. And I think that uh, probably, I don't know this for sure, well, I kind of do, but I don't have evidence of it. I think that when patients linger on, sometimes the nurses just might give them a little bit more morphine that they're supposed to have just to help them cross over because mm. I think that mum felt quite guilty leaving four young children, that she felt like she couldn't leave this plane she, uh, because she needed to stay here and look after her children. But she wasn't looking after them being sick in a hospital bed. Yeah. But after that, I started having dreams and mum would come to me in my dreams and she'd say to me, I'd say, oh, mum, you're here. And she'd go, yeah, I'm here. And I'd say, I thought you were dead. And she'd say, no, I didn't die. And I'd say, what? Well, where have you been? And she said, well, you know, you don't die. And I would get so angry with her. If you're not dead, then where the hell have you been? What do you mean you didn't die? I've been doing this by myself. I've been looking for you and you're not here. But what was happening was that that young mind of mine that didn't understand that we are eternal mm -hmm. and that we don't die, that we live on, could only interpret her message from a physical perspective. So I understood her saying to me that she was still in her physical body and that she had, she didn't die, she just pretended, you know, like mm -hmm. Elvis is still alive. Right. And she went to live in another country or another state or in my dreams she was always somewhere else she wasn't at home she wasn't in my environment she was in a shopping mall or another state or another country so I'm trying to with my physical mind work out interpret the message that was given to me during my dream dreaming experience mm -hmm. because I wasn't open enough to understand what was going on so I'd wake up really frustrated and angry that because the dreams were so real, Sandra. They were so real. And I'd wake up in the morning confused and think, oh, I'm back in this reality, in another reality, and this is real and that's not real. And that's the thing about the other side. You've spoken to many people who've transitioned and come back, is that when you're there, that's more real than being here. Like, this is the dream. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that, that, that's and, wild to even... Yeah consider that but that is yeah. what they all say yeah and that's what I used to feel I used to wake up into this experience and sort of shake my head you know, like where am I and, and be confused and then think god another one of those dreams that you know that I, I didn't die but death has been a friend to me I've known so many I've had so many close people that have transitioned and as I kept looking into the meaning to life, reading books, going to psychics, going to gurus, like who are we, what's it all about, and expanding my awareness and my knowledge of what's possible and who we are, like this ever-expanding opening, I suppose. I, I suspect you've been experiencing that too, Sandra, with your inquiry. Yes. Just keep expanding. You just keep expanding of what is possible like who we are and what is possible, those dreams started to make a lot of sense. But uh, the book Return to Love is about my experiences talking with people on the other side because all of the people that have died in my life came back to tell me one thing and that was I didn't die. <laughs> but I have to ask, how did the girl who couldn't understand the dreams of where your mom was all of a sudden start now talking to dead people there must well, have been some here's shift. the thing about Who that came first? This is, what? well this is the thing that's really interesting that you ask that question we're always talking to dead people all of us all the time and that's what I wasn't understanding here's this young girl that didn't understand having dreams so my dead mother was talking to me I wasn't a psychic or a spiritual teacher I was a selfish teenager uh, you know, trying to get on with her life. And in my dreams, I was being spoken to by my mother and she was trying to relay a message that there's no such thing as death. She didn't die. And that she was trying to say to me, I'm here. You can talk to me anytime you want. I'm, I'm available. 
I did not die. I was speaking to someone the other day, a client who came and, and her husband died a year ago and she has a young five-year-old son and she was saying something like, and this person said, and your father's dead, you don't have a dad. And the father came in and the father said, well, you tell him that he does have a dad and I'm always here. I'm here for him. I'm here, but it's just a different relationship you have with me now. Before you had a relationship with me in my physical body, but now you're having a relationship me with me as a non-physical body. And that's that's the message of the book Return to Love. Oh, bling. That's the message of the book Return to Love is that you don't have to be psychic to talk with people on the other side. They are communicating with us all the time. We have a constant relationship with our broader perspective or our non-physical perspective. And that non-physical perspective is also our higher self. So you can talk to yourself, your higher self, or you can talk to your dead relatives, for a better word, or or dead friends or dead loved ones. They're always there to communicate with you. And they're knocking themselves out to try and communicate with minds that were like mine as a young child that are closed to this understanding that 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 we can we are greater than we perceive that we have an energy field that com is communicating all the time with non-physical and uh, and that if we want to with our intent and our allowing we can communicate with anyone who's on the other side that's as you said in the introduction you don't have to be a psychic or john edwards to talk to the dead right. you just have to be open to it can you give just, us some stories or examples of when you first started realizing that you actually are talking to people that have crossed over oh that's a good question i don't know it it, it didn't sort of go bang i'm talking to dead people it just unfolded it just unfolded one of the things that really made me understand that i have access to non-physical communication all the time is reading the book conversations with god by neil donald walsh that's a great book in that book there is two aspects speaking there is the the one that we were talking about at the beginning of this interview that that egoic mind that says i'm not enough I need, I want, I can't. So that was the personality of Neil Donald Walsh. And then the other part of the conversation was who he deemed as God, the higher self, speaking exalted wisdom. And so as you're reading the book, you're getting the experience of these two minds communicating in a book. And, right. But what happens in his book is what happens in everyone's mind. But he's just com com compartmentalized it as me and God. But me and God is everyone. There's me and God. And God could be dead relatives or God can be your higher self or your angels or your guides. I don't compartmentalize any of it. It's all exalted wisdom. It's all pure positive energy. And it's all there communicating with us all the time, all the time, all the time. So as I'm reading this book, I'm having this conversation in my own head because as I'm hearing his questions, more questions are being evoked within me. And then I'm saying, oh, that's a good thing. But what about that? And what about that? And, and as I'm asking the questions, I'm having this dialogue with my higher self. That's commune. And it, I was very present to that communication going on within me as it was going on in the book. So as and you that, were ans asking questions, yeah. the answers are just coming into your mind. Absolutely. Absolutely exalted like amazing wisdom i should have written it all down really but amazing amazing insights incredible insights it's it's like i'm constantly in a classroom and the little me the the little egoic me that that doubts and and doesn't know is constant being taught by the bigger me and that bigger me is um, a plethora of teachers and some of whom have been physical and i have called mum or best friend or because when we all transition, all of us re-emerge back to pure positive, to broader perspective, consciousness. And we all become exalted wisdom. I remember once watching, you know what, Sandra, one of my favorite things to do is to go on YouTube and watch near-death experiences. Because people speak about it from a memory, you know, of being there. And when they speak about that 
experience from a memory, they evoke that same energy that is our source. And our source is love. And all of them will speak about love. And so when they evoke it, as they speak about it, you can tune into that same energy. And so if you're feeling down or or feeling in doubt, sometimes I think a great thing to do is to listen to a podcast like you <laughs> where people talk about love and that we are expanded beings and all is well, or to watch, you know, near-death experiences and hear them speak about it. And one woman said, in that state, I knew everything. And that's who we are, you know, in that state when we're not physically focused anymore, we're non-physically focused, we have broader perspective and we know everything about everything. So we can communicate with that part of us or we can communicate with our loved ones who have re-emerged back into that. And now we have a personality to grasp onto to communicate with what we deem as God. But one of the most incredible experiences I had was my best friend in the world, she, um, I was God, well, I am Godmother to her son. I was present at the birth of him. We were best mates. Anyway, she had always been a very happy girl. Something happened. She, she experienced depression for about a year and she spoke about killing herself a lot. Well, one day she did it. So on this day, I'm a single mum at the time. My daughter's about eight or nine. And I have a Japanese student staying in my home who, who is uh, an older woman who was just the most gorgeous. She was about 58 and I'm in my early 30s. And I, it was Christmas time and I was taking my daughter to her school play. And um, I thought to myself, I was in that, I'm so busy. I've got to cook dinner for Annika and Yumiko, so my daughter and her and the Japanese student. And I've got to get, get the costumes and I've got to get to the school by 6 o'clock. And it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and I think I'm just going to grab a shower and then, you know, get it all organised. I'm sitting in the shower because I, I love to sit on the bottom of the shower and just let the hot water run over me. So I'm just going to take five minutes out to just sit in the shower and just relax just chill out and get back into the busyness like in a minute. Mm -hmm. So as I'm sitting there, I shut my eyes and there's this really clear vision of my mother's face, like like in 3D. It's just, it's a profile, just her face. It's a profile. And then the face turns and looks at me. Oh my God. It's so visceral and so real. And I, and I go, oh, Mom, you're here. And I open my eyes trying to stop the image. I don't have time to talk to you right now, I said to her. <laughs> I've got to get Annika to school. I've got to feed them. I'm a school player. You know, I'm in my busyness. And so I open my eyes trying to stop the vision. And it was a very insistent energy. And as I opened my eyes, I all my other senses were engaged. I could smell her. I could feel her. I could hear her. It's like every inch of my being could sense her. I had this incredible memory of her. You know how the smell, smell is so interesting. I could smell what she used to smell like. And she'd been dead for years and years and years because I was 16 when she died. I'm in my 30s now. And I had this incredible memory of what it was like to be in the presence of my mother and it wouldn't stop this sensation would not stop and so I just said I just don't have time to communicate with you right now can I call you back that's hysterical, <laughs> that's hysterical. who does that <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh well thanks for being honest okay so that's what happened I jumped out of the shower trying to stop this sensation so it started as a visual and then it, all the other senses kicked in right. and just started, started to get into my busyness. And as I did it, it disappeared. And so I go to the school play. It's all lovely. But it turns out that right at that moment was the time that my best friend committed suicide. Oh. And, um, yeah, so I said to her, you've got something to tell me, uh, but I don't have time for this right now. But you know what's really interesting, Sandra? I'm kind of glad I did that because had she communicated with me that that Kate was transitioning, because as much as I understand that there's no such thing as death, it still really hurts when someone you love leaves this physical plane. Absolutely. Still really hurts. And, and oh, God, I can't tell you how many people have I've known that have left. I still cry and, and mourn and go, oh, that's so sad. 
not sad for them, sad for me. Right. But um, yeah, so she had committed suicide and the experiences I had with Kate on the other side were incredible. She really, because we were great mates, we spoke about everything together. She really showed me many things about being on the other side. I would go to sleep at night and, and as soon as I would fall, you know when you fall into that sleep, it's, it's always an unconscious thing. You never really know when you fall asleep. You know that you're about to, but you never know the moment when you do. And then you wake up and you think, oh, when did I fall asleep? Right. <laughs> so as soon as I would fall into that, fall into that other experience, that other focus, she would, it would be like she was sitting on the end of my bed waiting for me to wake up into an, another realm, another experience. And I'd go, oh, Kate, you're here. And then we'd go off and she'd talk to me about life on the other side. And uh, one of the things I remember was touching her and saying, why can I feel you? If you're a spirit and I'm a spirit, why can I touch you and feel you as solid? And she's looking at me smiling and she's going, I know, I know. It's amazing, isn't it, how we are incredible creators and she says, because you have memory of what it is to touch someone. The physical experience cannot be experienced when we're non-physical, but we have memory of the physical experience. And so just like the holodeck on Star Trek, we can recreate it as a reality. And uh, that's what a lot of people do in non-physical. They can recreate a physical experience in a non-physical environment and live it out again. I think you've, you've probably heard that when people go into near-death experiences and they have life reviews, right. they say they're looking at it as a, as a visual, but then it's not just, but they're in it. They're not just looking at it like a television screen. They're actually in it. They're experiencing it again. And so, God, we're magic, Sandra. We are just, we are just genius creators. We can just, but armed with that knowledge that we can do that from non-physical, here's the thing, we can do that with physical we have the ability to create it's all just energy and information that we're molding with our thoughts and our ideas and we do it in non-physical we can do it in physical so the people that died showed me who i am and what's possible and yet the little me still goes really can i really do that still doubts still says but I don't understand this and I don't know how to do that. So there's still the big me and the little me. In dreams and was your vision with Kate like clear like it was with your mother? Yeah, completely. Not all of them, no, they don't all come through dreams. Many of the experiences I had was while I was asleep because here's the thing, when you're asleep, you're, you're non-physically focused. While we're here, we're physically focused and the physical dimension is so seductive that it takes your attention off the non-physical and you've got it, you've got your attention on the computer screen, the television screen, the road, the people around you. Your, your focus is, is, I might turn off um, my, sorry, email. Your focus is elsewhere. So when spirit wants to communicate to you in really, uh, meaningful ways they often will in your dreams because you're not physically focused you're not distracted by the physical reality yeah. but if you if you have an intention and you have enough allowing so here's the the trick not the trick's not the right word but here's the idea of experiencing communication with non-physical from physical focus you have to take your f focus off the physical Put the focus within. That's why meditation is one of the best ways to attune your vibration to allow you to have visceral experiences speaking with the other side, both your higher self and your non-physical friends that have transitioned. So taking your focus off the physical, putting it within, you can put it on your breath, you can put it in your imagination, you can, put, you can bring your awareness down to your body, the breath is one of the most the best ways but practice of meditation really attunes you to receiving their vibration because their vibration is a high vibration non-physical energy is pure positive energy 
And most of the time here in our physically focused experiences, we're experiencing a different frequency of vibration because we stress and we worry and we, uh, and we doubt and that creates a different vibration to spirit. So the happier you are, the more relaxed you are, the more carefree you are, the more access you have to them. Because right. that's a similar vibration to them. Yep. I speak often about, uh, and many people have told me, some of the visitations they've had in the shower when your mind is quiet. And, and that yes. whole thing is when we can quiet the mind. Or even Sweet. driving in a car, sometimes we're on autopilot and, and yes. it feels like it. And, you know, I've had the instance where I felt my grandmother sitting right next to me. You know, and I could yes. feel her skin and things like that. I want to ask you something about your friend Kate, because I know we have many listeners who have had someone very close to them commit suicide. Um, Do you, did she shed any light on life after that? I mean, there's a lot of um, beliefs in different realms. Sometimes that people are punished for suicide. I myself feel compassion that if someone's life was that tormented, they must have had it really bad in, in order to do that. But, are our our friends and loved ones who commit suicide are they okay when they cross oh gosh yes absolutely every single person that leaves this physically focused dimension re-emerges back to pure positive energy what can happen though sandra is and you hear a lot about people who have hellish experiences when they commit suicide is that Our personality is made up of, you might have heard people like Bruce Lipton or other Mm -hmm. scientists talk about the subconscious mind. So so it's like the hard drive of your computer. It's full of programs about who we are, what's possible and what we believe. And those programs could be religious and they're the programs from our schooling and then the programs from our culture and, and, uh, you know, our politics. We're completely programmed. We're like this bunch of programs. And Bruce Lipton will say that that's what's running our life. It's not our dreams and desires like and our conscious mind. Oh, I want to be rich or I want to be thinner or I want to be healthier. Right. What runs us are those programs, right? And that that kind of creates the personality. That creates the 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 like a like an actor reads a script of a person. So that script, Sandra or Karen, is like all made up of all these different ideas, ideologies and programs and beliefs and structures and that that creates you in your play called Your Life Right Now because when we re-emerge, we see our life. Oh, another great book that uh, I read recently was The um, Application of Impossible Things by Natalie Sudman. Have you read that? No. Near Death Experience. Great Application one. Anyway, of impossible, of impossible things. things. It's a, it, about her near death experience. She was blown up in Iraq, but I'm getting off track. So okay, we sorry. see our life as as we were an actor in a play. Like if we are eternal beings and we have choice about who we are, we've been mothers, we've been fathers, we've been children, we've been all these different actors. And when we reemerge back into non physical, non physically focused dimension, we become the sum total of the experience of all that we have lived in many lives and so we're so much greater than the personality that we are right now i've forgotten the question what was the question i forgot the question as well (laughs) oh no it was about suicide it was about suicide. suicide yeah so what happens with some people is as they are because spirit has said to me that we don't travel anywhere and that all life exists non-physical life and physical life exists in the same Um, space we're in like our loved ones are right here with us there's no such thing as time and space from the other side so from that understanding they're right here with us and if we want to contact them they're there right now right here I love that and I always (laughs) explain that we can't you don't have to see it to believe it because we can't see the internet around us or wireless exactly television signals or radio signals or GPS signals and yeah so I'm glad you said that because that's feels so good just to know (laughs) so when we shift our focus so this is what we do every night we die every night we shift our focus from physical to non-physical as we when we re-emerge we shift our focus from our physical so our physical are those programs that we call Sandra Champlain or Karen Swain and 
we start to shed the ideas of who we were and we come out into a new dawn of who we are. But as we're shedding those ideas, we get to experience some of those beliefs. They play out as little plays. I remember reading once about a near-death experience of a guy who was a pastor and he was like a Helen Brimstone type pastor and he was always telling people that they were going to go to hell. Right. <laughs> and when he had this near-death experience, he experienced the devil and the devil <laughs> said to him, you're in hell for doing this, like for the simplest thing that he did that he deemed as unworthy as his pastor personality that he was always telling people not to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, you you read about these pastors, the, the, the most judgmental, the ones that have created the sins that they're judging right. people for. Yes. So he had created the sins that he was judging people for and he experienced this sort of devil image and it was his guides having the biggest laugh they were just rolling around laughing at creating this experience of him being in hell <laughs> because they were sort of showing him what he had done to others as he was transitioning back into non-physical. I tell you what, they have a laugh with us sometimes, they really do, because they see this whole arena of physical life as this delicious play and they don't take any of it seriously, even death. I mean, death is the thing that we get most upset about. And um, and they'll come back to tell you, you, you know what? I didn't die. Please stop crying. There's no such thing as death. You just got to get over this death thing. We don't die. Don't you love that message? <laughs> I do. How? Do, see, it just sounds so easy, though, for you to talk with them but how about the rest of us how can we get it's into easy. a practice that, well, that that is how, one of the do do? best that is one of the best mantras that you can say what? it is easy it is easy to talk with my loved ones on the other side it is easy because here's the idea that stops us from doing it it's hard only psychic people can do it right you have to be different to who i am to be able to do it that person that speaks to the dead, oh, she's amazing. She's different to me. And the message that they give me is that we all do it all the time. Start focusing on how it does. And as, as I said at the beginning of this interview, what you focus on expands. Whether you're focused on good or bad or what you want or what you don't want, when you focus on it, it expands. Start noticing the feeling of your grandmother sitting next to you or the dreams that you have start focusing on it as a young girl the inquiry of who are we and why are we here and what's it all about and where do we go when we die and where do we come from I mean we're focused on those on finding those answers and so because of my intention and my focus it was revealed to me through my life experience and through many of the deaths that uh, that people um, gave to me. Another best friend of mine was a girl called Nikki. She was born thalidomide affected. And so she was a very sick little girl most of her life. And we were best mates. And she died when she was 40. She lived a long time, actually. The doctor said she was going to die at six. They said she'd never be a teenager. They said she'd never oh. be an adult. They kept telling her she was going to die. And here's the thing about Nikki. She smoked, she drank, <laughs> she had torted love affairs, the love affairs, you, you know. Wow. She did everything she wasn't supposed to do, but boy, she enjoyed her life because she thought, well, I'm going to be dead soon, I might as well have a good time. And she kept li living, living and living and living. She actually got a brain tumour and, and uh, she was on the transplant list to have a heart and lung transplant because she had a lot of internal problems. And she was looking forward to getting a new heart and lungs because she used to be blue most of the time because she had a hole in her heart and um, and the heart was not pumping oxygenated blood around her body. It was pumping half oxygenated, half unoxygenated blood. So she looked blue a lot of the time, especially if she walked up a flight of stairs, she'd go completely blue. Mm. And so she was looking forward to having a heart lung transplant. But when they found out that she had cancer, the doctor said, okay, there's no way that she'll have a heart transplant now that she's got cancer. And um, once she knew that, then she just said, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going, I'm leaving. But she'd had about three or four near-death experiences and I'd always said to her, well, what brought you back, Nikki? And she said, well, the first time it was mum. As I was leaving my body, I could hear my mum going, don't die, don't die. And so she said very dutifully, I said, okay, mum, I'll come back. And so she came back. Wow. She said the next time 
was no big reason really just 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 more experiences just 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 more I just wanted more and I loved that it was no profound I've come back to heal the world right um I've come back to tell people about God or about life after death. it was just more and that would be our mantra to life it's like why are we all here more more experiences just more another experience just just more on this delicious physical plane which is like a playground from non-physical from broader perspective they look at this life like a playground and they love all of it what they say to me a lot is is love all of it you know the pain and the death and and the sickness and the trauma from our perspective all of it is wanted and all of it is an experience that expands your awareness of who we are and who you are. Wow. And, uh, and now that sounds good, but I watched my dad suffer something terrible when he died. And, you know, I, it, it's interesting because there is the higher me that I can either be a victim of something or yeah. I can say maybe that was for dad's growth. And I know for myself without witnessing his death the way he did and learning about grief, I would never have my book. So I know that there's yeah. juicy things that come out of everything, but in yeah. the midst of some pretty brutal suffering, it's kind of hard to make sense of it. It is. I agree. It's really hard. In the midst of our pinching off our connection to our broader self, which is love, Right. So what we do is when we see someone suffer, we suffer. Yes. And often often we suffer more than them, you know, because we're suffering over their suffering and we're suffering over the fact that I think, especially with someone like you, Sandra, who, who is such a helper, such a giver, such a carer, in, when you see someone suffering and you feel helpless right. to be able to help them, then that is, that is, you're suffering more than he is. And so, um, yeah, you know, there is suffering here on this physical dimension and we are at power to lessen our suffering and even alleviate it by choosing to view it from a different perspective. And this is what they say to us is that, you know, look at life through the eyes of source and look at life through the eyes of love. And as you look upon someone that is suffering with loving eyes, you alleviate their suffering. But as you look upon them with through your suffering eyes, your focus is not helping alleviate their suffering. I once heard from one of my spiritual teachers that uh, Jesus was so connected to his broader perspective, to his God self, that he never saw the suffering of others. He would only see their magnificence. And that gaze was so powerful that it would create instant and miraculous healing in them. Wow. Wow. And you know what? I wanted to ask you about healing. And at the, towards the beginning of the show, you said that uh, you didn't use the word, we can create heaven on earth, but just that we're the same beings and just in the physical. Um, somewhere I read that you've seen uh, healings and things. Can you talk about yes, some sure. of that? Well, the most amazing thing during my 30s, it was a very intense time of research for me. I had a, I was a single mum. I had a young child and I was doing a lot of energy healing courses. So what happened was uh, the questions led me on a trajectory of what's it all mean. So I started studying naturopathy five years full time in my 20s, finished it and opened a furniture shop because I didn't think that I learned anything that was going to change the world. It was all fascinating. I loved it. I hung in there. Had a baby right at the end. A year later, I opened a furniture shop because I love pretty things, right? Mm -hmm. So had that for about four and a half years and closed that down and went in back into massage because to, I needed to make some money. And I was good at it. I was really good at massage. And I had learned that during my five years studying as a naturopath. And um, I used to do it when I was studying as well. It's a good way to make money. And as I was putting my hands on people, I used to experience a lot of psychic phenomena. I used to be able to read their thoughts. I could uh, see their future. I could see their past. And, and I used to tell them things and freak them out. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> so I had to stop calling myself a masseuse and start, and start relabeling myself. Mm -hmm. So um, 
what do you call yourself when you can see inside people? I mean, hello, what do you call yourself? So spiritual healer. So I started studying a lot of energy healing. I was doing theta healing at the time. It was about 15 years ago, theta healing. You know, have I you heard of no. Viana Stiebel? She has a healing called theta healing. And it was about developing your psychic ability, uh, looking into the body as a medical intuitive, speaking to your guides, speaking to other people's guides. Gee, it was fun. It was so much fun. And I came home from a, a healing course that I'd done and I had taught my young daughter to, I said, so this is what we do. We just go up and talk to God and we just make a command and then God does the healing. So it's really about having that relationship with your broader self. But you're not doing the healing. The universe is. You're just asking for it and then allowing it. With everything in your life, you're doing that. Whether you want to speak to dead people or manifest something in your life like a lover or health or money or whatever it is that you want right. to create. You don't create it. You, you're the asker. The little me is the asker. And then the, the, the universe or God or life orchestrates the energy and, and um, formulates everything that you're asking for. And then you as the healer or the person that is the manifester of the desire has to allow that to happen. So, so that's what a healer is doing. They're asking and then allowing. So I taught this to my daughter. And then I was seeing a lot of clients and doing a lot of sort of psychic stuff with them and energy work. But I wasn't seeing anything with my physical eyes. So I said, I want to see something with my physical eyes. And so my daughter gave me the experience one day. She came home from school. They were digging up the plumbing out the back. So the garden was all dug up and all these rocks and pipes were uh, exposed. She was out there playing. She cut her foot. So she gashed her foot open. She came running into the house. I was again in the shower. <laughs> and she comes running into the bathroom, screaming with blood pouring out of the bottom oh. of her foot, mud all over it. And I look at it and freak out. And I go, oh, my God. So I threw her foot in the shower to try and wash some of the mud off. And... I just didn't really know what to do, but she was in such a panic that my thought was, I'll just stop the bleeding and that will stop her screaming. So I threw her on the toilet and put her foot in my hand and just went up and commanded a healing. But what I noticed, Sandra, is that I couldn't feel the blood oozing out of her foot under my hand. I expected to feel the heat of the blood it was, as it was gushing out of the foot. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't feel that on my hand. So I took my hand off to see what was happening and the wound had completely sealed in an instant. Just sealed. Oh, yes. my And the two, <laughs> the two of us sat there. The two of us sat there on the <laughs> – she was on the toilet. I was sitting on the floor just looking at her foot in just astonishment, like just amazement. We just went, wow, <laughs> wow. And what had happened, it had healed so quickly, it was dark underneath the skin. I didn't know if that was dirt or, or blood under the skin because the skin, the top layer had just, it had just sealed instantly, instantaneously. And um, so I asked for it. I said, I want to see something with my eyes. So they gave it to me. <laughs> and I've seen many things like that. Many, many. Can you tell us another, stuff. one more story about that? Well, this isn't something that I saw with my eyes, but I was, um, I was living in the same house, house. I was looking into a yoga studio. It was a wet, rainy day, and I was walking up the, um, some back stairs, cement stairs, going up to this yoga studio, and, and they were closed. And as I was coming down the stairs, I fell down three flights of cement stairs because I was all wet, and, and, I, and I cracked the bone in, in my arm. Oh. And... Um, I didn't go to the hospital because I was doing all this healing work. And here's the thing about this healing work. If I was doing it and paying lots of money, that I had to really believe in it. What I find really interesting with a lot of healers that I know is that they spend their lifetime studying energy healing work and then when they're sick, they go to the doctor. And I think, oh, so you don't actually believe anything you've, <laughs> you've studied and spent all that money on. But I wasn't like that. I was like, if I'm going to you know, do this stuff, I'm going to believe in it. So... I looked inside because I'd, I'd been taught how to look inside the body and I saw that I had a fracture. I'd fractured my arm. I was in so much pain. I can't tell you. I was in – the pain was radiating. I felt like I was filling the room up with pain. It was like these radio waves coming off wow. me. And I just commanded a healing and I couldn't stay awake because I was in so much pain and I just went to sleep. And when I woke up, I looked inside and it had healed. 
um, the fracture just completely as the cut had. But this was what this, I had seen this with my psychic eye and not my physical eye. So I had no proof of that. But what I did experience over the next couple of weeks, if you've ever broken your arm and had a cast on and when you take the cast off, you're still very wary that your arm is sensitive and, and it has this sort of, the arm has its a new awareness. It's like if anyone comes two foot towards the arm, you mm. sort of back away. You know what I mean? Right. You've got the sensitivity. It's like, don't come too close. Don't come too close. You know, I, I'm still sensitive in that area. So that's what I was like for about two weeks. It's almost as if I'd had the cast off, but I still had that incredible sensitivity. The arm worked, and um, but it still was in, amazingly sensitive. So, yeah. Was the pain, you, did the pain subside uh, immediately? Completely, completely, yeah, completely. Yep. Th when I woke up. Mm. Yeah, that's miraculous. Yeah, it was miraculous. It was absolutely miraculous. But the um, the relationship that we have with non physical is a is a miraculous relationship. We just have to trust it and know that it's there for us. Whether we want to communicate with our loved ones or communicate with God or Source or or whatever you call it or your angels, we are so divinely loved and and looked after in so many ways and. That little me, you know, we forget, we forget. And um, and experiences like that, they give you these heightened experiences and then we still go off into life and forget. I say to my daughter when she's worrying about money, I said, don't you remember that your foot healed instantly, like in front of your eyes? <laughs> what are you worried about? And she goes, oh, yeah, but, you know, oh, yeah, but. So that little me is still is always going to be asking questions it's so funny that you're talking about this because i have witnessed miraculous things i have yeah. talked to dead people i've i mean yeah. the things that have given me goosebumps in my life have happened so many times those really wow experiences and uh just this morning i have a, a coach uh, somebody that i talk to on a weekly basis who supports me and everything i'm up to and I have a fear going on about something, about having a conversation with someone. And I just, like, I just can't get past it to pick up the phone and I'm struggling. And so he gives me all this great coaching advice. And, you know, it's not, you know, it's not my higher self and it's my ego and da, 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 all this stuff. So it's been a while since I've actually picked up my own book. And I actually write about fear and how to deal with it if you have trouble talking with someone and to get their <laughs> perspective and to get what's going on with fear and miracles are on the other side of fear. And, you know, it's like I feel like such a dope, but I, I don't <laughs> think we're meant to remember 24-7 that we're these infinite souls or else what would be the point exactly. of living life? without these the, experiences, it, right? Exactly. The little me is the creative part. The little me is the one that asks and the little me is the one that summons the energy to answer. The little me is so important. The little me is the expansive part of you, you as the personality, as the physically focused person. So the little me forgets. And then asks to remember, and then you remember, and you have these amazing experiences, and you're like, oh, yeah. I am the greatest, I, and then you forget again. <laughs> I had a little battle with the little me this morning, and I was stressed <laughs> out, and then all of a sudden, I had such a, like an aha moment, and uh -huh. I just thought, you know, and I'll just share with you what it, what it is, because I of, you often hear that when you hang around with successful people, you have more of a possibility of becoming successful yourself, yeah. that uh -huh. you're, you know, most like the five people you hang out with. And so I just had this thought that we have these physical needs, spiritual needs, uh, emotional needs, intellectual needs. And I thought, you know, uh, in the times of YouTube and podcasts and reading and iPhones and all this stuff, like, a lot of us are not around five empowering people a day, but like what little <laughs> habits can we do so that those people are in our lives just by these other means? So anyways, you know, I can spell it out more a little later on, but it was just such an aha moment that like I don't necessarily have to find five great people that I can listen to things in the car. I can start my day watching a empowering YouTube video. Like I can nurture 
my emotional self, you know, like all these great things. And like without Thank you. having that, you know, really awful, Thank you. bitter, I hate myself, you know, which, you know, is where it all stemmed from I... this morning. And I can't stand some of the things that are happening to me right now. <laughs> like I would have never had that thought, but I've never thought of like blessing the little me, the little voice. And, and without it, you know, like I would not have had the other thoughts. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Look, well, thank you because, you know, there are many great guru life coaches out there that are telling you things like, in order to be successful, you have to hang out with successful people. And then, and then those little me's all over the planet go, I don't hang out with successful people. What I want to say to you is you have a plethora you have a army of non-physical brilliant beings hanging out with you all the time talk to them well you know? one more thing is i don't know if any of our listeners have ever traced their roots a little bit and done what's on ancestry.com as one of the resources but i actually started dabbling in my past and i yep. have a small family right now of alive people and there is an army of people uh, in on many continents that are my ancestors and I just thought you know what a nice vision that there's this army of people with me and yeah. that like I could talk to them I just yeah. it's just a and then I really like how you say like we can use the mantra it's easy to talk to my dad it's easy to easy. talk to my grandmother it's, it's easy, easy. And, easy and to put the attention on that could leave an opening for a great thing to happen so thank you great. for that our time's Absolutely. going by fast so what i want to oh, do yeah. is yeah. shift into you know who is karen swain and what the heck do you do in the world and what do we what else do we need to know about you how do you apply your gift to making a difference with people in in your business and what is your business wow How's well that? how I, <laughs> how yeah look how i like how all this has you know, how it manifests as a physical reality. I mean, it's all great knowing all this stuff, right? right Having all right, these right. amazing experiences. But how does it look in the world? I feel completely connected to every being on the planet. And that is a beautiful thing because as a, as a selfish, insecure teenager, I felt very disconnected. So it's been a, a journey. It's been a long journey and it's been a journey of unfoldment. It didn't sort of happen bang and now I've right. woken up and I feel connected. It's just like I was having a conversation with someone on my show the other day called Kerry Phipps and she wrote a book called Do Talk to Strangers. And it's like having that openness and that friendliness and that fearlessness to be able to feel connected and open and in love with everybody. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like no fear, no fear of people. I think one of the biggest fears we have is not fear of the future. or de It's like fear of what other people think of me. Yeah. You know, f that fear of, of talking to someone, oh, they're going to think I'm stupid. Oh, I can't talk to them. I don't know them. It's like when you have a relationship with your broader perspective, you understand that we are all brilliant, incredible, amazing beings. We all have that broader perspective and we're all forgetting that we're that and we're living inside our little, uh, the little me and, um, and asking questions and fearing and like everyone's the same but different. We're all same, same but different. Mm -hmm. And so when you get that we're all one, we're all the same, you can reach out to anyone, anywhere, anytime and feel like you're in service to them and that you don't need anything from anyone, that you're the giver of life and not the taker of it. And, and that's a beautiful feeling. And, and, and so I, when I'm with anyone, I can look at them with, through the eyes of source. I can, I can look at their mistakes and I can criticize them. The little me still says, oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> And then the broader me kicks in and says, no. but isn't that beautiful? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and uh, and that's that's a really beautiful thing. And uh, so, so what I do is I love people like you and I interview uh, as a teacher of deliberate creation. So I'm teaching what I've been taught. I've been taught through many books and many gurus and, and teachers here on the physical plane, but my biggest teachers have been the ones that, ha that are non-physically focused, my guides, wow. um, dead relatives. I call my guides blissful beings. And that was an unfolding too. So as a young girl, I was looking into spirit guides, like who's my spirit guide? I, I want to know the name of my spirit guide. And I remember doing a course and having a tape, it was tapes in those days, 
of meet your spirit guide. And I went back to the course and I said, I didn't meet anyone. I don't have any spirit guides. And they said, oh, just do the tape again. And it was a visualization where you walk along a path and you sit at a pond and then you invite someone to come in and they walk towards you. And so I'm not getting any visuals. And I'm saying to them, because I'm speaking to a nebulous nothing, like, why don't I have a visual of someone, like a, a person, a, a red Indian or, a, you know, or a dog or something? And they laugh. They laugh at me a lot, Sandra. They laugh and they said, oh, Karen, you are the creator of your own reality. What would you create if you had a spirit guide? What would they look like? So I'm a young girl at the time. I said, oh, I'd, I'd have a spunky man then, please. And so, bang, there's this handsome man who comes and sits next to me, has a laugh and says, well, you've created me. Here I am. And I started to understand that we are the creators of everything, yeah. even what we think of as spirit guides. We're, you know, we're creating an image or a name or an ego. And, um, and when you're talking to your, your dead relatives, for a better word, or dead loved ones, you have that already created for you. You can talk to source through them, through their ego and their personality. And, and, uh, and that's a beautiful thing. It gives you something to focus to grasp mm -hmm. as you speak to your broader perspective because when you're speaking to them now you're not so much speaking to them as they used to be you're speaking to them as a part of God as that as that broader perspective and uh gee I've forgotten the question again I start Just I like what to do rave. you do for work what do we need what to I know do for work you? so <laughs> I I'm teaching I teach that I teach deliberate creation um, they show me all the time that we're creating all of it with our focus and our imagination and our allowing, allowing the energy to flow. And we allow that through our vibration. So every thought holds a vibration. And the more positive or the better feeling the thought, the larger the amount of energy we allow to flow, which is what attracts into our life what we want. So I teach that. I see clients one on one. I put on events for the difference makers. Once you understand that you're powerful and that you can create what you want in this world, what are you going to create? I want to create a world that we all want to live in. It's all very well wanting money and love and health, but what else can we create? And so I put on events for the difference makers, people that are on the planet that really know that they're here to make a difference. I interview and showcase people that are making a difference in consciousness, in the environment, in relationships, in all different ways. And, and then invite people who want to make a difference. So there are so many beautiful, delicious young people out there that know they're on the planet to make a difference. But they don't exactly know what that looks like. And so I invite them to come and hear people that are doing it and, and that helps them formulate ideas about how they too can make a difference. Maybe they want to join these people in their environmental issues or, or maybe they want to take their idea and run with it. And, and uh, we put on a big Peace Day festival last year with a friend of mine called Deborah Shepherd from Embrace Life, Live Life, um, celebrating peace in the world and um, showcasing International Peace Day, which is a focus of peace each year that the world does. 21st of September is International Peace Day and um, Unconscious Creating Night. So I invite people to come and um, ask blissful beings, my guides, questions That's on anything. So Neat. Do, yeah. people, do people have to be near you to work with you or do you work on with Skype and over the phone? And oh, no, I do a lot of Skype. I do okay. a lot of Skype. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't need an office anymore because um, I can just work on the computer. It's fantastic. Oh, yes. So, and yeah. I know that we're speaking to a lot of difference makers right now. I do. Know yeah. That. I do know mm -hmm. that. Um, just one quick last question because it's got to do with deliberate intentions uh, yep. some of the thoughts in our head are so deep rooted so autopilot now you know of course I'm speaking about myself and it's really hard to change thoughts how do we go about uh, I mean I know there's more to it probably than a 30 second answer but how do we do you that's a great question. You know what I'm going to, I have this thing, just one quick thing. I have a visual of some of the thoughts in my head being like weeds in a garden. And mm -hmm. they are just, there's so many of them. And how do I cut mm -hmm. through and, and replace them so that I can have a good, healthy flower The first garden? thing that they're saying to me, Sandra, is appreciate the beauty of the garden. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> See the weeds flowering and love the flowers. That's the first thing okay. that beautiful beings are saying All to right. me right now. 
The next thing that they want to say to you is you've, you've already decided that it's hard to do it. Change that and you'll change everything. This is easy. Oh, my gosh. Uh, this is easy. Yeah, you and see, I you... have decided it's hard. You know, that's yeah. what's so funny. Like, I can, I can you, totally you, get you're that. Deci- what you're saying to me is I'm overwhelmed. There's so much and it's so hard. And that's what you're creating. So you can't change anything from that vibrational stance. Okay. So you've created a vibrational stance that says it's bigger than me and it's really hard. And, and that's not the truth. That's just what you believe and that's what you're creating. So the first thing they say to me is look at those weeds and just appreciate the garden like weeds are flowers, right? They're beautiful. And, and when I was studying naturopathy as a herbalist, the most potent and powerful herbs were the weeds, the dandelions and the stuff that we pull up from the garden. They were the most powerful healers. So see Isn't those little negative funny. thoughts, those little negative weeds, those little negative thoughts as your powerful healers. They are powerful healers. They're part of the garden of life. And so appreciate them. And then say, as easy as it is to pull up a dandelion and repot a different flower, like I just choose it, because none of them are good or bad. They're just wanted and unwanted. So, okay, so you've got some weeds and you want to plant something else. It's as easy as pulling it up and planting something else and see it as easy. You know, you're creating your garden. See your thoughts as your garden. Appreciate all of it and love it. And just like a gardener, you can choose whatever thoughts you want and you choose them by the way it feels. So if you're experiencing a thought that doesn't feel good, then ask yourself, is this what I want? And change it if it's not. Because here's the thought that stumps most of it is that we can't change the way we feel. And, and there is a, a collective thought form that says a tiger can't change his stripes It's hard to change people. You'll never change people. Once you've decided who you are, that's who you are. And I say to people, if that was the truth, I would have no business because what I do is I help people change their mind. I help people change the ideas of themselves. So if they have ideas about themselves which don't feel good, it makes them feel small and limited, then like, like the garden, we just change the flower bed. That's something beautiful. That's I'm better. glad I asked you that question. Yeah. And it's easy. It's easy. That's your mantra, Sandra. It's easy. This is easy. I can do this. This is easy. I love this. This is my work in the world. Those negative ideas I have about myself, they're my medicine. Wow. They're all part of my garden. And to our listener right now, Karen's not just talking to me. <laughs> She's talking to you. And it's easy, whatever it may be. And it's easy. Oh, I challenge all of us to take this one on and really, uh, gosh, love the weeds. I love that some of the weeds are the most powerful healers. Powerful Holy, healers. That's awesome. I was speaking to, oh, this is someone you might want to speak to, Annie Kagan, who wrote the book, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers. Oh, you have to speak to Annie. Okay. Beautiful book, beautiful book. Anyway, we were having this brilliant, it's a part, I've got the podcast on my website, beautiful okay. discussion. Um, Billy, who was her dead brother, was talking to her about what it's like to be dead. Oh, you'll love this book. Anyway, and he was saying, the world is your oyster, the world is your oyster. And I said to her that I had an experience of my grandmother, who I never knew, came to me in a dream. And she said to me the same thing, the world is your oyster, Karen. And then Billy goes on to explain it even better. And the sand, which irritates the flesh of the oyster, creates the pearl. So it is those things that irritate us in our life, those bits of sand that get in under our oyster shell that irritate us, that creates the pearl of our life. And it was just like, ah. <laughs> That is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Whether it's me in the weeds or a vision of the pearl, sometimes <laughs> us being able to visualize it in a story like that is we can really get it. So thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. The analogies are beautiful. Blissful beings have the best analogies. Aww. They come out. Well, thank you perfect. so much. Thank you you're for welcome. your time. Thank you, thank so you for the good that you're doing on the earth. Um, do you have any closing thoughts before I say goodbye to you and our listener? 
Oh, look, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. I think it's such an important message, this we don't die. As soon as I saw your podcast with those words, I knew I had to speak to you because that's the message that all my loved ones on the other side have said. I am not dead. I mean, that's what the book Return to Love is all about. We do not die. We are eternal and we're here and we're with you and we love you and you can speak to us and never feel alone. You are never, ever alone. We are around you and we're loving you. Just open to that. Just feel it and it's easy. Oh, thank you so not, so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really <laughs> a pleasure to have you here today. And to our listener, we have been listening to Karen Swain and her website is uh, K-A-R-E-N-S-W-A-I-N dot com. And if you go to we don't die radio.com, you can see the lovely picture of Karen. And I'll have uh, links to her website and her Facebook page. And even I'll find that uh, Annie Kagan interview and have a link to that because yeah. that sounds yeah. great. Um, it might be interview. a little while before I get to interview her. So I really thank you, Karen. And oh, thanks so much. Again, thank you to our listeners. And I love it's all the feedback that I've been getting. Um, for those of you who have uh, mentioned comments on iTunes, that's fantastic. Uh, I've taken your suggestions and using them. Many people have emailed me too from the website. And, and please feel free to reach out and ask questions.